I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
Good morning, good Sunday morning, good blessed morning to everyone. This is a day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad. I bring you grace 
and peace and blessings from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, and soon coming King. This is Pastor Duncan. There's a powerful word from God today for you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for everything that you have done for bringing us to this hour. Somebody does not know how they made it through to get to this hour, but Lord, we give you all the glory and honor because you are God who keeps your promises. Let someone know when the word gets inside of them, it's going to ignite their spirit and they will be stronger. They will be able to handle whatever they're going through and they will be in a relationship that it will be closer to you in their relationship. So I thank you today, God. Let us remember as we, as we approach this day, this gift you've given us, that our past can't hurt us. Our present is being protected by you. And our future is filled with favor. Bless this word now, God. Bless me. Bring back to my remembrance everything you once said. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 27. I have your King James, but I think I'm going to go to American Standard Version, Genesis 27. A very familiar passage, but there's a blessing in this passage for us. i got to read a few verses, so hang in there with me. Let's see where I can pick this up to get our blessing. All right. We're going to start at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 27. I'm reading the American Standard Version. It's a powerful uh, word of God that took place as a foundation of the patriarchs and how we got to be blessed as the seed of Abraham, the, the, the blessing of God to choose his children to bless. And we are part of that godly family. Let's look at verse 1 of Genesis 27. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of thy, my death. Now therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me venison. And make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison, and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto thee. Thy brother Esau saying, Bring me venison and make me savory food that I may eat and bless thee before Jehovah before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of goats, and I will make them savory food for thy father such as he loves. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat, so that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. I'm smooth. My father, preadventure, will fill me, and shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. And he went. And fetched, and he brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food, such as his father loved. And Rebekah took the goodly garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands, and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I'm Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according to thou hast badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul, that thy soul may be blessed. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found this so quickly, my son? And he said, Because Jehovah thy God sent me a good, with good speed. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, 
that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto his, Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. As in a, We're going to speak from this thought. As long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow today, there's a power in this passage. It's going to be self-explanatory as we go through it. But the title of the message for today, write this, is Fire and Desire, the Power of Passion. One more time, for those who are writing down, Fire and desire, the power in our passion. I heard someone say the graveyard is full of great people who never reached their potential, who never saw their promises come to pass, so their dreams come true. These people never found their purpose. So when they die, all of their greatness died with them. It's all buried in the cemetery. So many people live life without a zest or a powerful life. So these people, unfortunately, did not achieve what they could have achieved here because of a crippling attitudinal disease. A crippling attitudinal disease. Their attitudes about life, their attitudes about what was happening to them, their attitudes about what was going on really stopped them in their tracks. And even some believers have been stopped from getting God's blessed because of that limiting, the limitations of their attitude that they have. Hear me. They had this crippling disease constantly follow them. And what was that disease? Here it is. They lacked passion. They had no enthusiasm. They were, not, they were not vigorous people. They were not excited people. They were not people that kept going. They were not people that looked at situations and made sure they were optimistic about where they were. They were people that got stopped on every turn in life. Everybody got the same 24 hours in a day. Everybody has obstacles. Everybody has trials. But some people cannot reach their greatness because you need passion in order to reach your grace. No hunger, no zest, no zeal. As a matter of fact, the only time they're passionate is when things are going their way. That's the time when they actually look out and say, oh, life is good. No, passionate people know how to handle life with their passion, whether it's good or bad. I don't care whether we're crying or shouting. The passion is seen through. That's why I entitled this message, Fire and Desire. Because that's what people are lacking. And if we as believers are going to be able to conquer or be able to continue with the work that God has placed on us in the world that we're living in now, you're going to need some passion. Now, I know some of you out there recognize the honest book that my title is a direct rip off of a song by Rick James and Tina Marie, a very popular song. Uh, it is a one of the uh, I guess you would say standards that everybody knows. Fire and Desire was the title. But I want you to know why I chose that song. Because the song itself, if you don't know the lyrical content, was about this man who ran into, you know, Rick James at the beginning of the song. He's doing this dialogue. He ran into his ex and, and she's telling her she looks good. And he looks at her and he, she sees something different in, in him. And all of a sudden he says, you know, it was you that changed me. And then the word, the song itself, I know you know the beginning of the song. Because he said... Because it was you that changed me with your love and sensitivity. But do you remember when I used to love them and leave them? That's what I used to do. Use and abuse them. Until I laid eyes on you. It was pain before pleasure. That was my claim to fame. With every measure, baby, tasted steer drop stains. Yeah, I was cold as ice. Long ago, baby, baby, it wasn't, I wasn't very, very, very nice. You know, sugar, sugar, sugar. I'm going to read what says here. Then I kiss your lips. Well, we know how that goes, right? Then I kiss your lips. And then he goes into that long, uh, that long note. He says, and you turned on my fire. 
Baby, you burned me up with your flame, took me a little higher, made me live again. You turned on my fire, baby, then you showed me what a love can do. Fire and desire, baby, I felt it coming through. He explained that when I got my passion, I wasn't who I used to be. When I got my passion, I could break old habits. When I got passionate, and I remember how I was passionate about loving you. You made me a better person. That is my hypothesis today. That is my, uh, what I'm bringing to you today is that most Christians do not, uh, my contention is most Christians do not function from passion. They really are very lack luster people. They really need more passion about their relationship and love for God. It shouldn't be based on stuff. It should be based on who God is. Amen, somebody. You should be more passionate about God's grace and mercy that he has blessed you with and kept you. You ought to realize that it is because of God's passionate love for us that we are where we are. What am I talking about? God's passionate love for you kept you when you should not have been kept. God's passionate love for you. Helped you when you should not have been helped. He loved you when you were not love lovable. He helped you when you shouldn't have been helped. He forgave you when he shouldn't have forgiven you because you did it over and over again. The reason God does listen to me, God loves you with a passion that made him give his only begotten son so that we could be free, be made whole and yet we are not reciprocal in understanding that if I can just get a little bit more passionate about my love for God maybe things in my life would change change. We need passionate believers. Come on. God is tired of folks sitting around acting like you don't remember all the blessings God has done in your life. And how are you allowing what you're in now make you forget the road you've already traveled on? I'm going to talk about fire this morning. I'm going to talk about your desire to love God. Do you know that your desire to love God and be what God made you can conquer any obstacle that comes in your Life, fire, passion. God's children need more passion. We need more enthusiasm, more zeal, more zeal, more fierceness when we talk about God. You ever met those kind of people? Um, I used to work with them that when it's about an hour before time to go, quitting time, everybody know them. They're packing up. They just die. All they do is watch the clock the last 40 minutes. Everything out of their mouth is it's almost time to go. Hate those kind of people at work. Or you ever work with somebody that the whole time they're working, maybe something comes up and all of us got to do a little extra, and all you hear from them is complaining, this ain't my job. See, those are the kind of people I'm talking about. You have no passion because passionate people understand it's not punching a clock. If an opportunity comes up and i got to do some overtime or i got to make something happen so that I can open up the door, I'm going to do what i got to do to open up the door. That's the problem. The people you look at and you see that have achieved, you see that have made it, the people who get through and get their blessings and go where God wants them to go, the people who got a smile on their face when they shouldn't be smiling, the people who can look around and say things ain't right, but I got a God who knows how to make them right. They're passionate even in their pain. That's the problem. People with passion understand. I'm not going to ever say it's not my job and I can learn another skill or I can make myself indispensable and God can open another door and bless me. You better get some passion and zeal for your life. Your passion comes with your walk. Jacob's going to show us that passion is something that must come internally from a desire and that fire of your love, and it creates a passion that brings you power. Passion from your walk. First of all, you, your passion comes from that spirit that says, um, the, the, the passion, first thing is, he brought me too far to give up. You know what, I look at some people, they're, they're really waning now. God's taking them through rough terrain, but now they're going through something that they forgot. That, you know Go back. I know you're too scared to even go back. But he brought me too far. Jeremiah is our example. Jeremiah was preaching God's word. And he was prophesying what God said. And every prophecy God said was a prophecy that was chastising his children. Telling them they better quit before he puts them in bondage. But all the other prophets were prophesying what people wanted to hear. So Jeremiah suffered. He was always in trials. And he was always in tribulation. Until he found himself locked up in prison in the 20th chapter. Because he prophesied something that they did not like. And then when he got out of jail. You know God still 
still told him, you still must prophesy. If you look at the seventh verse or in that 20th chapter, you'll find out that Jeremiah starts his complaint to God. He said, God, you deceived me. You, 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 you didn't treat me right. But then in verse 9, he said this word, and I love it, because he said, but if I say, I will not mention your name, or I will not speak anymore in your name, your word on the inside of me is like fire. It's a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it, but I can't help it. Jeremiah said, when I really think back, I don't know what you're doing right now. I'm helping somebody. I don't know what you're going to do. Lord, I've been asking you for stuff and it hasn't come. But my passion is telling me you brought me too far for me to stop now. So like Jeremiah, when I think I'm not going to talk about God, something pops up in my mind that makes me say, praise the Lord. Something pops up in my mind that makes me say, I'm not going anywhere. Your walk should be the first. I, I He brought me too far. The next thing he walks in, so it should be a, a cup that overflows every now and then. I know I'm not the only one. Isn't God better to you than you are to him? Okay. I'm not going to wait for an answer because I know the answer. The reality is the cup of your life every now and then flows up. What's the overflowing cup? It's when you sit there and go, oh, mm, God, my life was here. And some days you look at it and say, well, Look what you've done. It's an overflowing cup that makes you say something no matter what's happening. It's like, uh, i got to be grateful because my cup is overflowing when I know it should not be. We can go to Luke chapter 17 and we look at the 15th verse. And above that was where Jesus uh, went and healed the 10 lepers. And that 15th verse says, And when the one leper looked and saw what he had done, he turned and worshiped or thanked him with a loud voice, passionate voice. He worshiped God with a loud voice. Somebody said, why are you so loud sometimes? Because sometimes my cup is running over. And I, I just got to give God glory for the thing that's happening. It's an overflow. Anybody ever had an overflow? It's like, it's good right now. And God has brought me through so many good things. I got an overflowing praise. Somebody listening to me right now, you ought to have an overflowing praise when you really look at it, even if your life is going through. There's an overflow in your life. And also part of your walk, not only because he brought me so far and I got an overflow, the other part of your walk is there ought to be always something in you saying, the reason I'm worshiping, maybe you're not, you don't know like I know where the Lord brought me from. Your praise should not be contingent upon someone else's experience. It's upon yours. The psalmist in Psalm 30 Verse 11 said, you turned my wail into dancing. You took me out of sackcloth and clothed me in joy. Listen to the psalm. You turned my wailing. I'm not, you know there was a sad situation in your life. And somehow God turned that wailing, that messed up situation into dancing. And he turned, he took that sackcloth, that suffering life, and clothed you in joy. And now he's blessing you. He took all those dark days and took you to a place where you could get blessed. Let's look at this text. Jacob is going to be an example to show us that you ought to come with passion. Jacob, uh, that you ought to come to God with passion first. Passion can fuel your faith. Passion can fuel your belief. Fire and desire for God can knock out all the voices of the enemy. Fire and desire for God can take you further than anything else. The love you have for God can conquer what the enemy is trying to do. Thank you, Jesus. Does somebody hear me? So the first thing we want to find out what Jacob did to get his blessing is. You want to write this down. The first thing he said was, what God has for me, it's right here in the text, is for me. I'll say it to you. What God has for you is for you. I'm going to share with you that you need to understand that no demon in hell can take what God has for you. And Jacob is proof. How do I know? The story of Jacob and Esau starts in the 25th chapter of Genesis. Our text is taken from the 27th chapter. But this is the lead in. In the 25th chapter of Genesis, we find out it opens up with the death of Abraham and him taking his last, his last wife, Keturah. Then it talks about uh, all the children that Keturah bore him. And then it goes into the descendants of Ishmael. And Ishmael's descendants and 
what uh, the, the, the names of those descendants and the fact that even though he was in uh, Abraham's lineage, he didn't get the blessing of the first son or the blessing of the promised son. Parenthetically, uh, very quick, succinct understanding of what's going on in the Middle East ever since for a long period of time. It can go back millennials to Jacob and Ishmael. I mean, excuse me, Isaac and Ishmael because um, the Muslims think that Ishmael is the son of the promise and the fight in the, in the Middle East is about land. So they believe that the land, the Pal Palestine belongs to the Arab nation because Ishmael came out first. Of course, they don't believe in the Bible. They believe in the Holy Quran. And they don't believe in the Old Testament. So the Jews are fighting the Arabs. And when you get that fight, the fight is over land. But I need you to know the fight won't be resolved until Jesus comes back because it's a holy war based on a promise that God gave. I shouldn't even got into all that. But I need you to know that's the basics over in Israel is based on an, a millennial old fight between the firstborn son, Ishmael, and Isaac, and who has the rights to the inheritance. Well, the Bible tells us that Isaac has rights. So, then it goes into, and Ishmael was born by his, his uh, hand, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, but then it goes into the story of how Jacob and uh, Esau were born. We found out that uh, Rebecca had been barren, but then she got pregnant, and if we go down to front third verse, he said, she was finding that the, her pregnancy was causing her problems. There was a lot of movement. There was a lot of rapping. There was some trouble coming from within. So she went to God and said, God, why am I like this? What's going on? Is, it, is everything okay? And God told her, there are two nations in your womb. There are two matter of people in your womb that are going to be separated. He said that the younger, the older is going to serve the younger because one person is, one people is going to be stronger than the other people. He said there's two nations, two manner of people. One shall be stronger than the other. And the younger shall be over or the older shall be ruled by the younger. What God said right there, and the first thing you need to understand is, if you want to know what God has for you, is for you. you got to want what God has for you. May sound simple, but put a pig in it right there. Put a stake in it right there and understand what I'm saying. You got to want what God has for you. And if you want it bad enough, you got to be willing to do what it takes to do it. What am I talking about? If you want something, and uh, I remember one night I had a toothache, and I was thinking about some Ambersol. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning when I woke up. You know what I did? I got up, went to an all-night drugstore, and found me something to put on my hurting gums. I didn't care that I had to be up at 6 o'clock the next morning. I wanted it, and I did what I had to do to go get it. We get in church and act like we get into uh, our destiny and act like we don't have to do anything that God's supposed to make all the blessings come to us. But the reality is, you got to act like you want it. Didn't Jesus win it? Yeah, but you still got to act like you won it. Look what God just said. There was a tradition that the firstborn son was to get the blessing of the firstborn. He was to get the inheritance, the bulk of it. He was to be the one to lead the family. He was the one to carry on the legacy. Jacob wanted that. Esau was supposed to get it, but Esau didn't want it as bad as Jacob. And that's what God is saying. You have to want what I have. You know, in the church, we got too many passionless people in the church, and that's why the church is in trouble. Let me explain it by this headline from 2007. It says, Pastor's wife is attacked and needs 20,000 stitches. Excuse me, 2,000 stitches. 2,000 stitches. It was a headline in the New York Daily News in 2007. The rest of it tells us that First Lady Teresa Whitfield was in church at Trinity Baptist Church in Hackensack, took her two-year-old daughter down to the bathroom. Her arm bar or a woman went down with her, and when they got into the bathroom, the woman grabbed her by the head, pushed her down to the floor, took a box cutter and sliced her from neck, head, arms, all over her body until she needed 2,000 stitches. Somebody saved the woman off of her. The woman subsequently that attacked her 
is in a mental institution and was charged with attempted murder, but that's not the part I want to tell you. I know the Whitfields. This story is not, I'm not speaking this without, you know, uh, them knowing I'm talking about it because Teresa Whitfield, the author, put out a book about her experience of what happened. And she put out a book called Celebrating Your Scars. She talks about her journey. I'm giving her a little pitch here. But it's a great book. But what I want you to see is this part of it. Let's look at, look at how this applies to my message. This woman that cut her up, how did she become her armor bearer? Because the woman joined church. She was very passionate about coming to everything. She was always on time. She was always there. She looked apart like everything was okay. Her mental health aside, because she does have mental health issues, here's the problem I need us to see behind the veil. The fact is, we as leaders in church, we don't have time maybe to do background checks, and we should, but the fact is, there are so many passionless people in church that sometimes we got to pick whatever, we got little pickies to pick from. So we got to choose whoever wants to be available. And sometimes that's somebody that means us no good. The problem is, and the sad commentary for the church is, there's too many people sitting in the pews when we were in the pews that we can't even pick you because you don't have no passion. We got a vision we need to do. There's somebody that popped up. All I'm saying is the church would be better if there were more people with passion. I'm not saying that women still wouldn't have done that. I'm telling you that there was more passion in the church. We'd have more to choose from. God could do more healings. There'd be more anointing. There'd be more blessing. There'd be less people burned out if we were passionate. But that story just led me to think, you know, that, you know, that there was slim pickings. And that's how the church is not able to do the things God wants us to do. But Jacob showed that he wanted, two incidents showed that Jacob wanted his birth first. Right? The first one is in uh, chapter 25, verse 26. You know what happened? Esau came out. He was hairy, red and hairy all over. And Esau was the firstborn. They were twins, fraternal twins. But Esau was coming out first. So he should have got the firstborn blessing. But Jacob saw his brother leaving and grabbed his heel and pulled him back. That's why they called his name Jacob, which means heel catcher or usurper or supplanter. Meaning that he tried to go out first instead of his brother. Somehow, instinctually, Jacob had enough passion that he said, I want to be the first. All I'm saying is, you need some passion. And then the second time is, in that same chapter, verse 29 and 34, is the incident where Esau came from the field. He was eating. He was hungry. He was famished. And he wanted something to eat. And Jacob was home. And he had made this stew. And Esau said, I'm fainting. Give me some stew. And Jacob said, passion not letting an opportunity go by. He said, look, I'll give you something if you give, sell me your birthright. He said, give me the birthright of the firstborn. And the text actually said, Esau said, well, look, I'm about to die. What is a firstborn birthright going to do now? I'll sell it. And Jacob said, swear. And he swore. Listen, he swore before God to give away his inheritance for his flesh. Mm-hmm. You got it. He gave away his inheritance to feed his hunger. Matter of fact, the Bible said he despised his birthright. If you go to Hebrews, there's a line in the New Testament about Esau. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17 says, Lest any fornicator or profane person, as Esau called him a profane person, who for a morsel of meat sold his birthright, Here's the part I want you to see. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place to repent. God said, if you don't have enough passion to keep what I give you or want what I give you, then you don't deserve it. He was rejected because of his passion. He didn't have any. He gave it away, and Esau wanted it. That brings us to this text. Isaac was dying, and he was about to give the right of the firstborn. You heard what I read. He said, Esau, go out and get me some savory meat so I can bless you. Rebecca heard it and said, he told Jacob, come on, we're going to do this, and we're going to trick your father. You heard the text. We're going to trick you. And so this sounds like it was deceitful, and it was. It sounds like it was bad, and it was. You said, Pastor Douglas, what are you selling up here? I'm telling you right now 
that because God allowed this to happen, there was something that God was saying about using people who have passion for his work, who want to be close to God, who want what God has out there. And that's who God used. I'm not saying it was right. What I'm telling you is that you don't know the context that Jacob was fighting against. Jacob wanted the blessing, but he was fighting against what was the context. If you go back to chapter 25, it tells us that as the kids grew, Esau loved, I mean, Isaac loved Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Think about that. So Jacob was against tradition. He was against a father who gives out the blessing. He wanted it. So he said, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to go get it. Now, I know it wasn't right, but it's easy for you to talk about me when you're not in my situation. See, he was, the context of the situation was he was against years of tradition of the firstborn, but he had a desire and a passion for that blessing, and he said, I am going to get it. So I believe this, that if you have a desire to get what God has for you, God will give you, because the problem is my failures, my faults, and everything else I go through cannot stop me, listen to me, cannot stop me if I want my destiny. I'll say that again. Somebody ought to catch that. I don't care how many times you fail. I don't care how many times you fall. I don't care what the devil has on you. He can't stop you from getting to your destiny if you got passion. Have I got a witness? There's somebody out there that can tell you my passion got me to a place that my faults and my failures could not stop me from getting to. So God said that we will determine our blessing by how we go. What am I saying? That if you want it, God will get it. You got to have passion. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, remember when the three, when the four friends were carrying their friend down to see Jesus and the place was packed and they couldn't get in? The Bible said that they started, tore the roof up and lowered him down through the roof. And the Bible said these words. And when Jesus saw their faith, how did he see their faith? He saw their faith through their passion. I know I'm hurrying, but you better catch this. He saw their faith by their actions. Or if you look at um, blind Bartimaeus, and we find out in Mark's Gospel, again, chapter 10, that when the disciples were coming through with Christ, blind Bartimaeus, a blind man sitting there begging, heard that it was Jesus. He started hollering, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody said, shut up. He started screaming louder. What happened? His passion got Jesus' attention. And if you read the text, Mark's Gospel 10, 46 to 49, you'll find out that Jesus said, bring him to me. He got noticed because of his passion. And that's what you have to know, that God celebrates our passion. And I love the story of the father who he asked the, the disciples to cast the demon out of the son. They could not. Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And when Jesus got there, he said, bring the boy to me. Then he looked at the father who was crying and all the people around who thought nothing could happen. He looked at the father and said, um, all things are possible if you only believe. And the father cried out something that should not have gotten his healing. He said, Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And Jesus healed his son. Why? Because even a cry of little faith, filled with passion, can move big mountains. you got to know. Second thing you need to recognize, not only what God has for you is for you, because you need to understand that, uh, just like Esau loved, Jake, Isaac loved Esau, Rebecca loved Jacob. I think whenever the devil takes one thing from me, God brings something else right around. God just doesn't leave you out there all by itself. You just got to believe. What am I saying? I'm saying that Jacob still had a chance because of his passion, because even though his father didn't love him, you see it was Rebecca that got in with him and, you know, kicked cooked up this scheme to get to help him out. I believe God always got something coming. I'm talking to somebody. If something has been taken, you're waiting on something, God is going to turn that thing around and bless you. And finally, don't you ever forget that God prophesied. If God promised it, it's going to happen. But what you do makes a difference. Not only what you got to believe that what God has for me is for me. Second point you got to understand is what you do make a difference. It's right there. So he went to his father, verse 18, and his father said, who is this? He said, it's me, Jacob. He said, are you sure? And they went through the whole dissertation where he had deceived his father. What I want you to see is, Rebecca helped him do the scheme. But if Jacob had not followed through, his actions makes a difference. You can't use somebody else's passion. You can't be in a house with a husband and wife, and they say they love the Lord, and they're doing what they're supposed to do, and things are going to rub off on you. You may get some overflow blessings. But you're not going to get the passion that takes you to your destiny. And here's what happened. 
Jacob had enough. But you know that was scary for Jacob? Standing in front of his father. I mean, these were traditions. As he said, I could be cursed. But he went through with it because when you got passion and you want something, you will allow your actions or your passion to speak for you. There was a writer that was watching these uh, birds. He was sitting in the park right here. He looked up and saw this nest. And this mother bird, he saw her flying up to the nest. And she had like food in her mouth for her babies because there was three little birds with their mouths wide open. But she would let the stuff fall on the ground. He thought it was a mistake. He watched her again. She came back again and let it fall. Then something miraculous happened. He saw the mother get into the nest and start nudging and pushing the babies out the nest until she had got one. They started falling and then they flew. To his amazement, they flew. She pushed them out so they would fly. Please understand, your actions are the only thing that would save you. This mother bird knew that if they never fly, they're never going to get their destiny. They were born to fly, but if they sat in the nest all day, they would never fly. And the babies would never get out the nest as long as the mother was feeding them. She said, go out and go get it for yourself. Go get it for yourself. What happened? He said, because did you know that if a bird stays in the nest, predators will get the bird? Do you know that if a bird stays in the nest, they will dehydrate? So what, he, what, what the mother was doing was saying, I'm setting you free so you can do and get what you were nesting to do. That's what this message is about. God is saying, can you lose your passion? Can you understand that your actions are going to get what you need? you got to pray. you got to praise. you got to believe. you got to trust. You can't depend on anybody else. Even through your tears, keep holding on. Because pretty soon, if you get out that nest, you'll learn to fly. But there's so many believers with no passion still in the nest. That's right. You get a little blessing here. because God feeds you a little bit. And you still won't go out and say, God, I want it all. Subsequently, Jacob blessed him. The blessing, we look at the text, is from verses 27 to 29. I want you to read it later. Because here's what it said. He said, I will provide all of your needs. He said to him, my God give you heaven's due and earth's riches and abundance. God always wants to bless those with passion with abundance. And then he said that others would bow down to you. God always blesses passion with leadership, abundance, leadership. And then he said, and those who bless you are going to be blessed. Those who curse you are going to be cursed. He always blesses passions with a connection to him to bring blessings. So Jacob was chosen to carry on the promise that was given. The Abrahamic promise that was given in the covenant went to Isaac and now went to Jacob because of his passion. Let me close. The blessing was foretold. Jacob now, if you read the text, Esau went back, and that's what Hebrews 12 was referring to. Esau went back crying, saying, Father, you got one blessing for me, please, just one. And his father said, no, I've already blessed your brother, and you're going to have to serve him. Let me close by giving you some biblical understanding of something. This was a dysfunctional family. All this stuff is going to come to a head. I'm not saying anything Jacob and Rebecca did was right. I'm saying the principle that they, of what they did, God blessed, because the principle was on Jacob saying, I don't want God's blessings, God's inheritance to go to somebody who does not want it. And God didn't want his inheritance to go to somebody who does not want it. God said, I will take the last and make them first if they have passion and they want what I have. And if you look at the text, Esau now said, I'm going to kill my brother. They had to send Jacob away so that he could get married. And he had to go to his uncle Laman's. And we know what happened there. So the last point is not only you got to want what God has for you. Know what God has for you is for you. Know that your actions or what you do, your passion is going to get you a blessing. And the third and final thing in this text is what you did to get there, keep doing. Here's what Jacob did. He went through until he got the position when God one day grabbed him by the thigh. If you don't know the text, the Bible readers, you'll find out after Jacob went through a series of things. Sanctification, God blessed him. Because Jacob... With his passion and with the crooked stuff he did, God was never going to let him stay like that. That's who God is. But don't judge Jacob 
Because you need to understand, all of us are going through this process of sanctification so God can make us what he wants to make us. But you got to have enough passion. He can't do it to whiners. He can't do it to complainers. He can't do it to people who don't want it. So the first step, the first ingredient is, I'm saying you got to have enough passion so when God does sanctify you, when God does chastise you, you'll still keep pointing yourself toward the blessing. And you won't give up. That's that's the message. You've got to have some fire and desire. And it'll bring a power of passion. And the passion will clear a path to all the things you are supposed to get and you want in God. This pastor Duncan is saying, God bless you. Have a blessed day. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free